Let's talk about gores. No, that's a verb, not a noun. No, that's a vice president. No, that's its own special thing. A gore is any pointy, angular piece of material that adds curvature to a surface. The fabric panels and umbrellas? Those are gores. Without them, the umbrella would just be a flat plane and have terrible drainage issues. The name probably comes from the old Germanic word for spear, gar, as in the opening line of Beowulf. We gardena, meaning we spear Danes. So they have a pretty cool etymology, but I hope to convince you they're even cooler than that because cartography. This is a globe. A terrestrial globe, because it represents the Earth. This is a celestial globe, which represents the heavens. Celestial globes are pretty rare now, but it used to be that globes almost always came in pairs. They're also kind of a trip, because the constellations are all shown backwards. They're the sphere of stars as seen from the outside. If you want to use them astronomically, you have to imagine yourself inside, at the center of the sphere, looking out. Making a globe is conceptually pretty simple. Glue a map to a sphere. But how do you make a flat map fit onto a spherical surface? It's the problem of map projections all over again, but backwards. We can fudge it a bit, luckily, since wet paper will mold itself to a curve. To a certain degree, anyway. As long as you cut the paper into thin enough strips, they will conform to the sphere without wrinkles. These strips are called gores. If they are going to completely cover the globe without overlapping, the gores will need to be a very specific shape. We know their length, that's the distance from pole to pole on the globe, or half the circumference. We roughly know the width of the strips in the middle, at the equator. Divide the circumference of the globe by the number of gores you want to use. And we know they have to come to points at either end, as they all have to converge at the pole. Though real globes tend to add caps at the poles, as getting all those infinitely thin gore tips to join perfectly doesn't work very well in the real world. And between those two points, they are going to be smooth, continuous curves. Something like this. But what shape is it exactly, and how do we construct it? Let's think of the orange wedge each gore represents. We'll divide that into evenly spaced sections, which I'll call stations. Each station will have a different width. Now we can start our gore by drawing a line that is as long as half the circumference of the sphere. Divide it into the same number of segments. Now take the width at each station on the orange wedge and transfer it to the equivalent point on the gore line. Once all these are transferred, fill in the curve between them. We could do this literally by taking measurements off of a physical globe, and that would probably be more than accurate enough. But that requires you to already have a globe of the correct size, so let's approach this a bit more rigorously. It will come in useful later. First, how do we divide the circumference into segments of equal length? Because this is a circle, it is easily done by dividing the circle into sectors of equal angles. If we wanted 10 segments, just use sectors of 18 degrees. Now we need to calculate the width of the wedge at every station. If we zoom in and look at it from the side, we'll find they all look like this isosceles triangle. The angle at the pointy end is determined by how many gores into which we're cutting the original sphere. Let's say we're going for 12, so each one is 360 divided by 12 equals 30 degrees wide. The legs of the triangle are how far the division points are from the vertical axis of the sphere. We'll call it L, and it's given by the sine of the angle for this station, times the radius of the sphere. What we want is the width of this top edge, as that is the width of the gore at this point. That's the chord of the angle theta times L, but sadly the chord is not a common trigonometric function these days. In more familiar terms, it's defined as 2 times sine of theta over 2, but don't worry about remembering that. It's easy enough to figure out just using the diagram we already have. If we cut the triangle in half, we get a nice right triangle with an angle of theta over 2 and a hypotenuse of length L. Sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, so sine of theta over 2 equals x over L, thus x equals sine of theta over 2 times L. Twice that is 2 times sine of theta over 2 times L, or the chord of theta times L, all of which are just different names for the top line we were looking for in the first place. We now have everything we need to define our gore. Do this at every station. Add the points to the gore, and then fill in a nice continuous curve between those points. Done. That's all well and good if you have a calculator or a book of trig tables. So how would this have been done back in the day? I found this paper 
on the construction of globe gores and the preparation of spheres in the 16th century to get an idea of how they would have done it. In 1527, Heinrich Glarion published a fairly naive approach, approximating the gores by using an arc with radius 5 sixths of the circumference of the sphere to be covered. Practical, maybe, but not very satisfying. Sometime around 1550, Philip Imser wrote some notes on a better system. First, we need a projection of the sphere with all the concentric circles of the stations marked on it. Luckily, this is pretty easy to construct. Draw a circle with the same radius as the sphere. Subdivide one quadrant of it with as many stations as you want. Philip Imser went with eight, but it's an arbitrary choice. The more there are, the more work you'll have to do, that's all. Take the sine of each of those angles by transferring its height onto the central axis of the circle. Draw circles using those radii, concentrically nested within each other. This gives us the projection we needed. Using this, the width of the gores at different points can be measured. First, an angle has to be drawn in from the center. If we want 12 gores, then this angle is 30 degrees. Every place it crosses one of our concentric circles, the distance from there to where that circle crosses the vertical gives us the width of the gore. It's exactly what we are imagining with the orange wedge, only done entirely geometrically. Copy each distance to our gore and complete as before. Done. So that's how to make gores for a sphere, and that's pretty satisfying. But what if we want to make gores for a shape that isn't a sphere? The Earth isn't actually a sphere, after all. I mean, it's not any perfect geometric shape, it's Earth-shaped. Or geoid-shaped, if you want to be fancy. But there are simple geometric shapes that approximate the Earth more closely than a sphere, such as an oblate spheroid. This is the shape formed by spinning an ellipse around its short axis, creating a kind of squashed ball shape. And the Earth is, in fact, a bit squashed, because the centrifugal force from its rotation creates an equatorial bulge. None of this actually matters when making a globe, of course. The oblate spheroid differs from a perfect sphere only about one part in 300, or far less than the tolerances for mass-produced cardboard learning aids. But maybe you don't want to make a globe at all. Maybe you actually want to make a spheroid. A friend recently wanted to do that, which is what got me thinking about all this stuff in the first place. What if you want to make a nice smooth egg shape, defined by rotating ellipse around its long axis? This is called a prolate spheroid, and my friend was trying to sew one out of stiff fabric. What shape should those gores be? We can follow the same process as above, but we quickly run into problems. To begin with, how do we draw an ellipse? One way to define an ellipse is the locus of all points whose distance from two focuses, when summed together, is a constant. So if you drive nails for those two foci and put a loop of string around them, you'll draw an ellipse if you run a pencil around keeping the string taut. The length of the loop doesn't change, nor does the distance between the two nails. Thus we know that the sum of the distances from the pencil to each nail also always sum to a constant value, giving us an ellipse. Neat, but not very practical for drafting. Getting the exact right string length is next to impossible, and nails have widths that mess things up, etc. You can also use some neat properties of an ellipse to our advantage by drawing a circle nested concentrically inside another circle. The smallest circle defines the minor diameter of the ellipse we want, and the larger circle the major diameter. For any ray you draw it from the center, where it hits the smaller circle will give the x-coordinate of a point, and where it hits the larger circle will be the y-coordinate. So just draw horizontal and vertical lines until they cross, and that gives you a point on the ellipse. Do this a bunch of times. Ellipse! Either way, let's assume we have our ellipse drawn. Now we need to subdivide its perimeter into equal lengths. Sadly, there isn't a good way to do this. I don't mean there isn't any convenient solution. I mean that unlike the circle, when we could get equal sections by using equal angles, there isn't any closed form solution for doing that with an ellipse. The best we can do is approximate it by turning the perimeter into a bunch of tiny little straight lines and taking an equal number of these. Inelegant, but fast and easy in our age of nearly limitless computing power. And there is some comfort to be taken knowing that you can achieve whatever level of precision you require as long as you're willing to throw more computing resources at it. At this point, the rest of the process is the same. It's just a matter of coding it up, which is what I did, resulting in this simple little web app. Link in the description. You can set the X and Y size of the ellipse, the number of gores, and the number of subdivisions for the perimeter. Using these, it will give you gores to approximate the shape formed by rotating that ellipse around its X axis. And it worked, at least well enough for my friend's purposes. I couldn't stop thinking about the problem, though. 
How could this be done without modern competing equipment? How would Philip Imser have done it with just pen and paper? There are two real problems to be solved here. How do we divide the ellipse into equally spaced sections? And given those, how do we get the width of the gore at each corresponding station? The first one can be solved, in quote marks, the same way I did in the code, by cheating. We can't measure the lengths directly, so we'll just have to assume that if we break it into enough small straight lines, that'll be close enough. This can be done with a pair of dividers set to about one millimeter wide, walking them along the curve and counting the number of steps. In this example, I'm leaving a mark every five steps, which will be the stations for this construction. The gore can now be started by drawing its central axis and walking it with the dividers at the same setting. Every five steps, make a mark. These correspond to the stations on the ellipse. Going back to the ellipse, draw vertical lines from each marked point down to the axis. This is the distance which will determine how wide the gore has to be at that station. The longer the distance, the wider the gore will be there. Draw vertical lines from all the stations on the gore as well, as we'll be using those to mark the widths. Now we return to the same cross-section view we saw on the sphere. We know this length L because it's the vertical line we just marked. The angle theta is again set by the number of gores we want to generate. The fewer the total number, the wider the gores will be, of course. How do we do this using pencil and paper, though? First, we need to draw the triangle using the angle as determined by the number of gores. It would be best if this were a power of two, as we can always bisect angles using the tools of the good book. If you would alter your hymnals to Book 1, Proposition 9. Let the angle BAC be the given rectilinear angle. It is required to bisect it. Take an arbitrary point D on AB. Cut off AE from AC equal to AD and join DE. Construct the equilateral triangle DEF on DE and join AF. I say that the angle BAC is bisected by the straight line AF. Since AD equals AE, and AF is common, therefore the two sides AD and AF equal the two sides EA and AF respectively. And the base DF equals the base EF, therefore the angle DAF equals the angle EAF. Therefore the given rectilinear angle BAC is bisected by the straight line AF. Amen. In this example, I'm going to use a total of eight gores, which means bisecting a straight line twice. But you can use a protractor if you like for any number of gores, just divide 360 by the total number to get the angle. Once the angle is constructed, bring in the length L and mark it on both sides of the angle, connecting with a line. This is the joy of doing things geometrically. We already have the solution we're looking for. It's this line right here. Copy its length to the matching point on the gore using the dividers. It gets even better though. We don't even have to draw this whole thing every time. The angle isn't changing just the length L. So we can draw the angle once, and then for every station, use the dividers to copy the length of the vertical line, mark it on one side of the angle, swing the dividers over to the far side of the angle, and reset the dividers to get the distance between those two points. As shown, this gives us the width we were looking for, but because we want it centered on the axis of the gore, it would actually be more convenient to use half the width, which could then be marked on either side. It's easy to generate this instead by dividing the angle theta in half and using that for the chord generator triangle. Repeat for every station and you've got a gore, or at least a set of points on the perimeter of a gore. For most purposes, a dozen or two will be more than enough, but you can always add as many as you have patience for. I found this solution very pleasing as I really enjoy trying to break out of the modern algebraic mindset. But I couldn't rest on my smugness for too long as I realized something. Nothing here is actually dependent on the shape being an ellipse. We subdivide its perimeter into sections of equal length, and we measure how far those are from the central axis. But neither of those operations really care what shape the curve is. So how does this handle other surfaces of revolution? Only one way to find out. Let's draw an arbitrary curve. Let's make it really hard even, doubling back on itself, something that would be particularly unpleasant to deal with algebraically. And then we do all the same things. Walk the dividers to subdivide the curve. Create our chord generator for half the desired gore angle. Transfer lengths L from the curve to the chord generator and use the chord it generates to mark our widths on the gore. Copy the gore, cut out as many as we need, and join them up. And it actually works. 
a generalized pencil and paper construction for any surface of revolution. Now that is satisfying. I hope you enjoyed this excursion into practical geometry. If you ever end up using it in a project, please let me know. And uh, if you want to encourage more random videos like this, like and subscribe, I guess. Happy Solstice!